Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Shades of Entrepreneurship. This is your host, Mr. Gabriel Flores. Today, I welcome an entrepreneur who truly lives life like a point guard. He brings his team in, runs the play, and ensures everyone gets credit when they win, but takes all the blame when they lose. This next entrepreneur exhibits true leadership, and that is what I want to highlight today. What is leadership, why is it important, and why should an entrepreneur care? First, it is important to note leadership is not seniority or a person's position in a hierarchy of a company. I majored in business management and leadership in Portland State University with an undergrad degree, but that does not make me a leader. Being a leader is not a job one applies for. In fact, it is not something you can analyze at all because analysts misconceive the tasks by gauging popularity, power, showmanship, or wisdom in long-range planning per Harvard Business Review. None of those attributes makes a person a leader. There are many definitions of leadership, but one of the best I found came from Tech Target. Leadership is the ability for an individual or a group of individuals to influence and guide followers or other members of an organization. And that is why leadership is important to an entrepreneur. This is not a do as I told philosophy, but more of a do as you would be done state of mind. It is the golden rule as coined by Dale Carnegie in the book, How to Win Friends and Influence People. Treat others the way you would like to be treated. As a leader, it is imperative to be willing to do what you're asking to be done. We talk about being the jack of all trades when being an entrepreneur. And that is also true about being a leader because leadership is about relatability. I can relate to cleaning the floors, picking up the trash, working an 80-hour work week, and putting in time on the weekend. Misery loves company, and mistakes are inevitable. But a leader views mistakes as a learning opportunity and not time to discipline a team member. Leadership is not to be confused with management. A leader will emphasize innovation while a manager may be more inclined to emphasize rationale and control. Manager may or may not be a leader and a leader may or may not be a manager. There are many books one can read to help become a better leader, but here are a few highlights to think about. Listening is a vital leadership skill. Give a speaker full attention, ask questions, and watch body language. Be a critical thinker and keep an open mind while asking questions. Perfect providing constructive feedback to others, not criticism, but feedback. Understand time management, short-term goals, long-term goals, and daily goals. Prioritize and plan accordingly because planning and implementing helps to find who the leader might be. When a decision is made, who will it be implemented by? Delegate and motivation are key. Nobody can do everything no matter how much we try as an entrepreneur. We need to delegate work to others. I can always find someone better than me at something I hate doing but know how to do. Those we delegate to must feel cared for and about or the quality of work may suffer. Every company has three types of employees, a cave employee, an RIP employee, and an engaged employee. A cave employee means this employee is constantly against virtually everything. They hate the traffic, the parking is horrible, the food tastes weird, their coworker stinks. An RIP employee means the employee is retired in place. They will come to work and do the bare minimum until retirement. I used to be one of these employees. Don't believe me? Go back and listen to my self-interview episode. Engaged means just that, an engaged employee, a team member there always ready every day to make a difference, even an inspiring leader. A leader's job is to help get those CAVE and RIP team members to become engaged team members. At the end of the day, the better the leader is, the better the career the team member will have because a leader will ensure everyone grows. And that is why the entrepreneur should care. As an entrepreneur, many communities and community members may look at you as a leader. Maya Angelou once said, A leader sees greatness in other people. He nor she can be much of a leader if all she sees in is herself. Being a leader is about improving everyone around you. So we all get better as a global community of entrepreneurs together. Thank you, and I hope you enjoy this episode. Welcome to the Shades of Entrepreneurship, where we interview entrepreneurs to inspire the future entrepreneur. I'll be your host, Mr. Gabriel Flores. So grab a drink, sit back, relax, and enjoy the show. Hi, 
My next guest is a business strategy extraordinaire who believes time is a commodity we have the least of, so use it wisely. A husband, father, and the guy that keeps Chosen Family Wines running smoothly. Please welcome the owner of Chosen Family Wines, Jacob Gray. This episode is sponsored in part by Burnside Knives, essential tools for outdoor enthusiasts and working professionals like yourself. Visit BurnsideKnives.com. Your knife says a lot about you. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Shades of Entrepreneurship. This is your host, Mr. Gabriel Flores. Today, I'm here with Jacob. What's going on now? Do you want to be called Jake or Jacob? Whatever feels best for you, brother. I go by both. Depends who's calling. I like it. I like it. Well, I'm I'm super stoked because we're going to hear to talk about some wine. But first, let's give a little background. Introduce the world to Jacob. Who who is Jacob? Uh, my name is Jacob Gray. I am a father. I'm a husband. I'm a businessman. I'm a friend. I'm just you know someone that's been going through this journey of life, trying to become a better version of myself every day. Uh, Portland, Oregon is home. I was born and raised in Davis, California, migrated south through college, San Luis Obispo down to Orange County, then actually got into the movie business for a little while, which brought me up to Oregon. Um, Got to make a golf movie, Abandoned Dunes, which was a unique experience. Oh, nice. Landed at Warner Brothers Studios in LA for post-production afterwards. Spent years of my life living that independent film world and then um, moved to Oregon for a couple years uh, to Portland back in the, you know, 13 to 15 years ago, went back to LA for a few years. And then I've, this has been home for the last decade, mortgages, businesses, kids, a uh, beautiful wife. Like this is home. I love it here. Uh, I feel like I'm on the tourism board sometimes because I'm always hyping it up to my friends all over the world, <laughs> but uh, happy to be here. Happy to learn how to make a living here, pay my taxes here. And uh, this is home. I love it. So look, I got I got to ask the, the, the movie world, what exactly were you doing in there? Um, Long story short, I I guess I was an independent film producer. Uh, It's a unique world and titles in it can always shift depending on what it is. But I think the true the true core of a producer is someone that can take an ideation or an idea from A to Z. Right. So you you can find the best team along the way. You can find talented people to to serve a purpose and do what their their core competency is. But usually a producer is someone that can own the rights to something and then has to see it through to the very end from financing it to writing it to helping write it to helping you know put people on the ground hiring people <laughs> budgets but uh I, w- I was on the production side of things so uh my mom's little sister which is my aunt was a- in the film business as i grew up i grew up in northern california she was in southern california so i got to see it from afar and then when i was graduating college in southern california she was just getting ready to bootstrap uh the independent film journey of golf in the kingdom golf in the kingdom is the biggest selling fictional golf book ever written and it takes place in scotland a young american kid on his way to india to find himself stops in scotland to have one last round of golf all the things he thought he had to go to india for kind of happened in this mystical moment and that mystical moment on film happened for us at band and dunes so instead of oh, flying awesome. a crew to scotland uh mike kaiser who owns band and dunes actually was a huge fan of the book and wrote his first check for the property to Bannon Dunes, signed it as Chivas Irons, which is the main character in that book. And when him and my aunt bumped into each other, there was all this cosmic energy. And that's kind of how that came to be. And then I was a young man trying to find my way. And I thought I didn't know exactly what I wanted to do. I had some ideas, but I didn't want to look back and not say I didn't go try to make some movies with my aunt about golf at Bannon Dunes and yada, yada. So it was was an incredible learning experience. Man, and who wouldn't want to, like, we were actually talking about before this, we got on, you know, asked me if I was golfing. If, if you're a golfer and you live in Oregon, who doesn't want to go to Band and Dunes? I mean, that's just pristine. Yeah, I got a, I have a unique relationship with that place. I mean, I'm one of the few people that's ever lived there for months at a time and made a motion picture there. I that's saw awesome. it go from two golf courses to six, five or six now. I knew Howard McKee, who was the architect and Mike Kaiser's best friend, which is McKee's pub at, at Bannon Dunes before he passed away too early. I was there when they were building Old Mac. So uh, Jim Urbina, who is one of the architects with uh, Tom Doak, I got to walk that course with him, watch him route it. Like the Sheep Ranch, we used to have a key to it because we did a lot of our movie filming there. So I know the Sheep Ranch intimately before it was a real <laughs> golf course. So I try not to brag about it, but I've, I've, I've lived Bandon in a unique way. And then I still try, I'm going there in May. Um, it's a magical place, man. I've had incredible moments there. Um, I love it. Uh, if anyone's never been, it's Mecca for lack of a better word. There's nowhere that it's, it's Zen in a way it, it kind of, it's what is golf all about? And I think golf's turned into golf carts and heavy drinking. And I think if you 
see where it came from of uh, going for a long walk in a beautiful place, getting beat up by mother nature. When you're done with it, there's nothing like it. So um, that's one of the few places they make you have that experience there. And it's, it's pretty, uh, it'll shake you to your core in the best way possible. It's, it's very true. I, I've loved, I love that course. In fact, I wouldn't, I would, wouldn't be too surprised if a lot of your work in, in the film industry probably has helped with your new venture. So let's talk about your new venture, the chosen family wine. So first, give give the folks at home a little a little background of exactly what it is and then how the concept was created. Uh, Chosen Family Wines is, I think, an, a wine brand for the now. It's a, a new age wine brand. And when I say that, the traditional wine opportunity was to buy a pr- piece of property, farm it till the grapes are ready to be made into wine. Then once that happened, take a couple of years to figure out what that wine is and how you're going to market it and sell it, and then maybe build a retail space on your vineyard to start selling wines, finding a membership and finding an audience. And that can be a 10 year game. And then it can be another 10 to 15, you know, five to 10 years to find, figure out how to break even or make money. Um, I live that on the other side of it. I've had the opportunity to build a wine business with my friend. Uh, his family owns a beautiful vineyard in the Dundee Hills called Longalo Estate. So I'm the general manager of that winery currently. Um, and then through our learnings there and uh, being really good friends with Channing Fry, who is an NBA player or ex NBA player at this point, and whose wine journey kind of coincided with my wine journey, where being great friends, we were I was sharing my my experiences with them, sending them wine. We every time we got a chance, we go wine tasting when he's in town or go out to dinner. And then I had other friends in that world, so I I think that wine's been at my dinner table and at a focus without me even really knowing it as a connector for a while. Um, and then getting to build a brand in the Dundee Hills of Oregon, you kind of, I came at it because I wasn't traditionally from the wine industry. I was wide open to, to learning and not having to do it how anyone else did it. And I think wine is, uh, there's a lot of mysticism around it. And I think there's a lot of misguided marketing sometimes of who really is the core audience. And it's only meant for certain people. Um, and that just did not make any sense to me <laughs> now. Um, and I like to say, just because you make a world-class wine doesn't mean you need to be an asshole. I think that we, it's yeah. our job to turn people on to wine, uh, share wine. And I think anytime you can share something, you don't have to sell anything if you're passionate about it. Um, so through Longolo Estate, uh, Channing Fry, dear friend of mine, we did some big dinners for the Children's Cancer Association. We would bottle some special wines for events. We'd get in the cellar and make some wines, chase the winemaker there, Chase Renton, who's a good friend of mine as well, a dear friend of mine, him and Channing are buddies, you know, and we just kind of had these sentimental moments. And as Channing was getting close to retirement, um, you know, we're friends outside of business. So what are you going to do next? What do you want to do? I know a lot of his passion points. And quickly, we kind of said, yo, we've flirted with this wine idea. Well, if we did it, how can we do it for ourselves and do it our own way, but make it a success, right? Let's not waste each other's times. Let's not make this a vanity play. Let's actually try to impact the wine industry to the best way we can from an economic standpoint, but like a disruption standpoint of, you know, culturally, like just bringing people into it, right? And a new audience, maybe that's paying attention. The NBA and wine has been hot for a little while. Um, yeah, and I think we've kind been. of been, you know, without trying to brag, we have some friends in that space and have been some of the people that have shared the wine with some of them. And been an educational component there. So I think we've just lived it organically. And then uh, we launched Chosen Family Wines during a pandemic going, hey, let's just release some really cool wines. We have we have access to great winemakers. Let's prove that we can make and, and participate in great wines. Let's share those with people. Let's tell stories around it. So Chosen started pretty small in, 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 in uh, reality, but I think the vision was always there to maybe be able to grow. And so we started plotting along. And then Kevin Love, another NBA legend who's still playing basketball in an Oregonian, uh, not that he still lives here, but he's from Lake Oswego, went to Lake Oswego High School, is a dear friend of Kevin uh, Channing's and has been a, become a great friend of mine. He joined our business. Um, we have a, my, a small uh, equity partner who owns Breakside Brewing, Scott Lawrence, who's an incredible resource. So we've kind of put together this little dream team of people going, I think the wine space is ready for us. I think that we have the opportunity to integrate backwards and really have access to great vineyards, great winemakers, storytelling. And wine has always been about if you pay someone for their grapes, you kind of just act like they're yours. You don't really always tell the, the impetus of where they came from and why you're working with those people and what that, why you're paying that price for those grapes to share with people. And I think, you know, it's 2022, social media is big. I think information is king. I think transparency is important. So I think that's who we are as human beings. And that, that was kind of what we wanted to adapt into our brand. So Chosen Family Wines is, I, on the back of our bottle, we say, uh, 
Friendship is our foundation, passion is our purpose, and wine is our connector. And I think I couldn't say it much better than that. That's just kind of our truth. And then wine, a lot of times, if you get stuck in farming one small piece of property, which there's so much beauty in that, right? But it also is so hard to do and so time consuming. And sometimes you get stuck being able to pick your head up and look around. Um, We don't just drink one type of wine. You know, you come to my house, we might start with some champagne. We might have some Oregon Chardonnay and Pinot Noir, then we might go to Napa, then we might go to Italy and have some wines from Barbaresco or San Giovanni. So I think we wanted to build a brand that can maybe help tell some of those stories and show uh, that we didn't just have to do one thing. And now it, it can catch people off guard. And, you know, in business, a lot of times people say, find your focus and just do this. And uh, I don't really subscribe to a lot of what people have told me a lot of times, right? I think that a lot of people that end up being visionaries or changing things is because they have their core truth and, and they have enough self-awareness to believe in what they believe in and then push the go button. So I think we've been learning consistently. It's not an easy endeavor. We also didn't want to make this about fame and platform. You know, it's nice to have a platform. It's nice to reach an audience. It's nice to turn people on to something and share your truth. But Channing and Kevin, you know, Kevin Love can make a Kevin Love wine tomorrow. Channing Fry could do a Channing Fry wine tomorrow. Yeah, yeah. And a lot of times, you know, fame is used to, pimp bad products and that was not what we wanted to do and i think for us that our part are their partners that live wine all day every day we definitely weren't going to do that and they wanted to work with us because they knew they didn't want to do that so it was kind of how can we all come together to create this family atmosphere this authenticity to share incredible wines tell great stories and then bring people on this wine journey with us so if they build trust in what we're doing and love what they're doing they can follow us along as we're introducing new products new people. And again, you know, at the highest level, no one has to work with us and we don't have to work with anyone. So I guess we get to kind of navigate our own or tell our own story and find our own tribe within the wine industry. And the wine industry is an amazing place, man. We've been lucky enough and fortunate enough to meet work, you know, know, work with and travel to incredible places and meet incredible people. So we're slowly building this portfolio of of wines that we love that we want to share with people. I mean, that's the long of it story, but that's kind of, I love it. I love it. In fact, let's, let's take a little step back because I'm, I'm intrigued to kind of know when the pivot happened from the movie industry to becoming the general wine or general manager over the winery, or was it a kind of a gradual progression for you? Or when did you start to decide to, you know what, I'm going to go ahead and pivot from that movie to something other than that's that. A great, that's a great question. So I, um, I, moved to, I moved back to Portland to be with my now wife a decade ago. And I was still an independent film producer, right? Bootstraps, not a lot of money. And produce, they always think producers have all the money. A lot of times they have all the relationships. They don't have all the money. And you go find executive producers that have the money. But anyway, long story <laughs> short, as I was, I was on a plane to LA a little too much. Um, I wasn't home. I wasn't in Portland as much as I wanted to be. And then I just, my breaking point was kind of, I think I was giving a lot more than I was getting. Um, and at some point you have to have the self-realization of what your truth is and what you want it to be. And I just felt like it was time for me to try to take on something new. Um, so I wanted to get off that plane. I wanted to figure out what I was going to do. Portland was going to be home for me. What was I going to do here? So I think, I, you know, I own the rights to some books. I was trying to, I was building a slate of films. I had a producing partner in LA. I, you know, I was trying to do the film thing, which is, you know, unless you have millions and just to say, go, it, it's always a grind a little bit. Um, so I just kind of said, you know what, let's see what else is out there for me and what's out there in Oregon. Right. And, you know, I have friends at Nike, I have friends at Wyden and Kennedy, I have friends that do this. And I don't know that I'm necessarily supposed to be a corporate person. Um, and I was trying to figure out what that was for me here. And one of the first iterations of like, Hey, Oh, what about this would be a cool idea is we wanted to do a really cool boutique hotel out in wine country or in a few different locations like hood river or the coast wine country and bend. But wine country kind of came to our mind. I always like going wine tasting out there. I thought it was ripe for advancement, ideation, something new, uh, you know, a fresh take on it. And my mother-in-law actually was the bookkeeper, the the controller at the Allison, which is a beautiful resort out there. So I I started just kind of poking my head around, learning a little bit about wine country, just a little bit. And then I I went to play golf one day and I met uh, a young man on the tee box at Pumpkin Ridge. And that happened to be Chase Renton. Had no idea what he did. And we became buddies. Then I figured out that his family owns a winery. They haven't built their tasting room yet. They haven't even released their first vintage or their first harvest was about to come out. And he got to, we got to know each other. And he's like, yo, if you're in this like transitional stage per se, and you, you, you like wine, do you mind just helping me for a couple months? And in my mind, I was like, 
I'll just tell the grandkids that I made wine one time, right? And now I'll be able to show up my <laughs> friends that I know what making wine's all about. So I got to do harvest, which I highly recommend for anyone. You know, it's like boot camp for lack of a better word, but you learn where the blood, sweat, and tears go and what wine, the craft of winemaking is all about. So I lived that for a, a summer because I could basically. Um, and then between that summer and the next summer, he was working on launching a business. Um, and if you get to know the two of us, he's a winemaker and I'm not, right? We have different skill sets, different personalities. Um, so I think organically, I started asking questions about how they were going to market themselves, position themselves, what's the story, blah, blah, blah. And I think, uh, and I got to know his dad, you know, who helped him launch this project. And they kind of said, yo, you want to come do this with us, you know, in some capacities, open a tasting room, be the tasting room. You can call it whatever you want, but there was only two of us, right? So um, I wasn't the general manager and I wasn't asking to be, um, but I was whatever I was, hospitality associate, you know. Other other duties is assigned. <laughs> uh, well, we were building a small business, right? And there was a lot to go into launching yep. an alcohol business with retail. There's a lot of minutia and compliance and stuff like that. And then there's also just, if someone shows up and they want to taste your wine, how do you get them to fall in love with you, right? And I think that I organically had some of those, though, that was my core competency. I mean, I can break bread with the best of them. You know, that's one of my favorite things is to know where to eat, how to eat, share things with people. Um, so anyways, Longolo launched in 2016. I did two harvests with them. They built one of the prettiest tasting rooms in the world. Um, and then we went to work building this thing. And we've been doing that ever since. Um, and it's been a, it caught fire a little bit. It's been an incredible journey. Um, and Chosen has been born out of that. But yeah, it was just me being back in Portland and trying to figure out what it was. And I think once I sniffed it and, you know, I always break down filmmaking, especially producing, it's just art meets commerce, right? You have these directors and artists and most incredible artists in the world. Sometimes they don't even like seeing their art, right? But they just give their all to it. And then you have the, the ability that you have to put this whole thing together and make it make sense, make everyone get along, execute the plan. Um, and and winemaking is a lot of that. There's the, the winemakers making something beautiful. They're perfectionists. They're really hard on themselves. They're really good at what they do. They hold themselves to a high standard. But then sometimes the consumer only cares so much about that. They want to have great experiences. They want to have great conversations. They want to know why they should love it. And so I think I've always, I think naturally I had some of those cosmic things that brought that world that could collide those. I think I am a producer. I think I'm a wine producer, but then I was given the opportunity to jump in the hospitality space, which I think came to me organically. Yeah. In fact, you know, I was, I was going to ask, how do you feel your experience being a producer has kind of helped? Cause it seems like you're, you're essentially being a producer of wine, as you mentioned, because you're, you're looking at individuals for their core competencies and then bringing those folks in. So how did the experience of being a producer and, and how, what was the importance of it to kind of building this new business? Yeah, well, so if I could describe myself quickly, I was a point guard growing up and then I became a independent film producer out, out of college. And then I jumped into building brands and launching businesses. And I think they're all the same thing, right? Um, you can call me what you want. I can be the CEO of this. I can be the general manager of that. I, I think at the end of the day, I am a producer. I think that's what I do. Um, but uh, yeah, it's, it's really like navigating the, it's, it's the ability to have a vision, understand who can help you execute that vision, how you can empower people alongside of you. Um, and managing people is tricky, but I think if you find talented people, then it makes managing easy, right? And I think building a team is always about finding the right people, not just people that think they're good at something, right? You have to understand, and you have to strip yourself clean. You got to kind of be able to get inside yourself and understand what your core competencies are. Hold yourself accountable. When things go wrong, maybe look at yourself a little bit. Like, I think there's a lot of just growing up if you want to be a leader, right? And I think producing is being a leader, you know, kind of yeah. in the day. So I think a lot of that just comes with growth. And then I've been asked, like, how does this happen? How do you become that person? And I think sometimes I don't know that I would have known how not to. I, I just was in the right place at the right time, willing to be myself. And then knowing that when I go to bed at night, I'm not lying to myself about who I believe I am. I'm actually putting in the work. I will show up. I have great relationships. I'm a very loyal person. Um, and I try to hold people to that around me. And then I like to have a lot of fun and I like to build great, meaningful relationships with talented people. <laughs> I love it. I love it. What, what would you say has been kind of difficult throughout this process uh, to start the business? Like some, some surprises in the wine industry in particular. Um, man, you know, anytime that you launch a business with, a, with more than yourself and you have partners, 
no matter how much you love them or know them, having partners, you just, it's like a marriage, right? You got to learn how to communicate. And I think that's wonderful. I think there's a lot of coaching out there that you don't want to do business with your friends or your family. If you have great friends and family and you've ever had to communicate, you got to get through shit, right? And I, I think it's the same in business. So I'd rather do that. And I'd rather win with people I love. So, um, but I think that that's, there's always a trick to that. Thankfully, I think because there was some history of being real friends um, leading into this, we actually made a lot of cosmic, you know, designing, design decisions, business decisions, marketing decisions. We like, if you had, if we all got a vote, we all kind of voted the same way a lot, all had great conversations about stuff. So we've, I think the, the ability to pull it off has been, I don't want to say easy, but you know, you're always navigating that world. And I think that you have to have the right people to do that, right? Play your position, know how to get the best out of other people. Um, the hardest I think is just truly doing it. The risk versus the reward. A lot of people always think that the, the journey, like you can, let's say you get on the cover of a magazine one day and they're just like, oh, you're here. This, you, your business is killing it. All these cool things. It's like, dude, we've been doing the same people doing the same thing, working just as hard for 15 years to get to this point. And truthfully about a lot of brands that people see, the ideation in the mind, the visualization of creating it, the partnerships behind it, this shit didn't just happen overnight, right? You manifest these things for a long time, whether you know you're doing it or not, not like in a weird way where you're like, secretly plotting to like pull things off it's just kind of like these things were meant to be but they take a lot of time and effort you got to be persistent you got to be passionate and i think you can't quit easily you got to really really i want to get paid there's not enough money we're gonna go broke it's like <laughs> wake up and do it again and, and don't question yourself don't quit on yourself empower yourself know yourself and i think you know it's a lot of just literally let's go we're, I'm not quitting until we get to where we need to go. What is quitting even? I mean, what's the risk of failure? What is failure? I, I think I like to think of that sometimes, but I'm going to end up on a yurt on the Pacific Ocean with my own farm and my kids body surfing for school. I, I don't really know what my risk of failure is. It always creeps in your mind. I'm almost more, I'm almost more scared of letting people down. Like if someone believes in me to join me on something that I'm passionate about, we're going, I, I'm going to figure it out. I don't like, yeah. you know, I don't like to lose. I think you learn a lot from losing when you're playing sports growing up and all that stuff. I like being on good teams with great people. And I think when you build those things, your success rates better, but you can't be afraid of those things. You got to kind of, you know, and you'll see that you'll learn that with your friends. Also, when you own a business, you'll ask this question is how do you finance it? Who's paying for it? You know, Oh, let's just go get a bank loan. Well, do we have the leverage to do that? Do we have the assets to do that? Would Eddie, Oh, let's go get a VC. Well, why you want me to just sell our business tomorrow and then they own 51% and tell us how to run it? Like you got to believe in yourself and you got to put your money where your mouth is sometimes. And sweat equity is one thing, of course, but it's really like you got to dig deep to understand. Don't just jump into things and call it a business unless you believe that there's something there that you're willing to fight for. I like it. You know, that's kind of one of the things you mentioned uh, all the work that goes in before uh, production. You know, even when those one hit wonders come out, People don't understand that those artists that maybe created that one hit wonder have been working years for that one hit. Yeah, you they know? created a they created a, a hundred not hits before they had that yeah, one hit. That that's very true. In fact, you know, you one of the things you mentioned is financing. How how did your team go through the financing? Did you guys go the venture capital route? Did you go as grassroots? Yep. Up until this point, whatever anyone's equity position is in the business, they've lived up to that. Um we're in a critical moment right now. Of, I mean, not, I, don't, I don't know what's too much info or not, and I don't want to speak for my business partners, but we're, you know, kind of in a capital call right now trying to figure out, we, there's a lot of potential in this business and we're really excited for it. Um, growth is a scary thing, right? And yeah, yeah. sometimes to make money and to learn the scale of economy, you got to take some risks to create the business that's worth being profitable, worth generating revenue, worth someone else investing in, worth being bought one day, right? So, um, but up until this stage, yeah, we've all... We've self-financed this thing. Uh, we started light and lean. I mean, there's a lot of perception around MBA, you know, people that have a lot of money, supposedly. It's like, well, a lot of people that have a lot of money are smart people that don't spend unwisely and make bad decisions. Yeah. <laughs> and they have great teams around them asking critical questions, right? So um, we've done it. We've done it. But we started really lean and mean. We're still really lean and mean. We still have never taken a dollar out of our business, right? I get a lot of people going like, oh, it looks, you know, social media can, we, it's an amazing brand. I think our brand value is out of the roof versus our revenue yeah. right now, right? Um, I think the ability to grow and people pay attention and be interested. I think there's a lot of, 
you know, it's been cool to see, you know, we don't have enough product and we haven't had distribution up until this point, which we're going to launch in May with Southern Glazers, which is an incredible distributor and gives us a lot of opportunity to grow into the future. Um, but people in New York, Cleveland, this place, Arizona, like, where do we get your wine? How do I get it? I want it at my favorite restaurant. I want it at this place. You know, and coming from a small business mind, like Longolo is the opposite of that. We're 99% DTC. You come into our tasting room, that's where you buy it. You join our wine club, that's where you buy it. We don't really do much distribution. So that teaches you how to gain and sustain an audience and, and be build some loyalty in your product. And, and Chosen, trust me, has some of that. And we built this. We've only been DTC during a pandemic, all e-com. We don't even have it. Like we've had a lot of hurdles in front of us to make sure we can sell some wine. And, and, and funny enough, like the core of all of us as partners, we like to break bread. We like to engage with people. We like to share. We like, you know, we want to pour our wines. It's been hard to sell wine to people that can't even taste your wine. Right. Yeah, that's very true. So we've, you know, but we've, we've made it, we've made that work up into this stage. We're going to start activating a lot more, having a lot more events, traveling a little bit and doing distribution. Um, I lost where our, our, the question was, but it's been, um, there's been a phases to all of that, right? You got to kind of sort your way through what makes the most sense for your business. Oh, we were yeah. talking about money. Um, yep. So yeah, up into this stage, uh, the owners, the business partners, the owners are the owners. I like it. Have you guys ever felt in a moment, you know, you kind of mentioned you're going through the growth process. Have you ever felt like any moments of self-doubt? My truth with that would be no, not in the sense of like, are we making the right decision? Is this the brand we should be putting our effort and time and money into? The self-doubt is just, there's a lot to do. We don't have a huge we don't have a lot of like overhead. Right. We, so like, how do we create this monster with no money? <laughs> and then the doubt can come in of shit. Like, are we in the position to make that capital call make sense for everyone that can give capital? Like, and you know, and when we talk about this stuff, you don't really want to dilute yourself too early if you're doing all the work. Right. So um, no, I'm not, a. I don't do these things with doubt. I do them with you know, my head on a swivel and always trying to learn and, and make the best decision possible for my the people around me. Again, I'm, I'm loyal and, and I take it serious if you want to go into something with me. So I'm trying to make the right decisions for everyone involved to make the create value for all of us. Right. And then also yeah. know that not everyone has to do everything. Like certain people got to be in the weeds. Certain people don't. Certain people need to help us promote things. Certain people don't need to be on every call, on every Zoom call and in every meeting, right? Like we got to have the audacity to believe and then stay the course. I think the, the hard thing sometimes with, with when you talk money or growth or these doubtful moments is a lot of times those set people back. Like, yo, let, I'm not going to, okay, today I, I didn't do my social media. I didn't go to the event. I didn't plan for the future because I'm worried about now. Shit, you got to do both. If you, if you want to grow, you don't take those step backwards. You just keep going and figure it out while you're there. Be adaptable, be flexible, but don't start doubting yourself so much that you, if you got through this heavy moment and actually the money lands and the things happen that you didn't yourself set yourself up for success. You got to have your eyes towards the future if you want to grow. Yeah. And what, what would you say kind of, you know, you know, you're thinking about growing, thinking about your business, you, you're coming from that entrepreneur mindset what would you say has been surprising in the wine business in particular that you didn't really think about? Like, Oh, didn't really think of, didn't think I had to think about this. Can you expand on that a little bit? Like, is there anything specific? Yeah. So is there any, like, is there any business like going through the wine industry? Is there any like kind of business um, either problems or issues that arose that you didn't, that maybe just might be within the wine industry that you didn't really think about that you had to tackle or have you been kind of going through this process? Like, Hey, this is kind of exactly what we anticipated. Oh no. I mean, anything you do with alcohol is tricky. Anything really? you yeah. do with sending alcohol to different States gets very tricky. All the moving parts to create one product. There's a, like, you know, you, you get into the business talk of like cogs and margins and those yeah. type of things. There's a lot of variables and those variables can shift every year or every month or every day. And then you're <laughs> relying on mother nature a little bit. Right. Yeah. So I think the ability to plan, have a vision, be able to know kind of your goals, but also having the bill, the wherewithal as a leader and as a business partner to know that shit's going to change and that you can't get, you can't just kind of tuck tail and run, do something that doesn't go your way. You got to be pretty, um, 
it's just you got to be pretty gritty in this thing. And then, uh, you know, the compliance of alcohol, the the TTBs, the colas, the compliance, the, you know, and then we're getting into distribution right now, learning that world, you know, there's just, and then there's a lot of hands in a pie when you want other people to help you sell wine. Uh, so yeah. it's just kind of really, you have these simple, like there's the people will tell you, okay, the DTC is this margin, wholesale is this, FOB or distribution is this. Yeah, they're, they're somewhat true, you know? Yeah. Every, I think every business would be a little different and everyone's uh, extra costs, overheads, say like there's just so many things that go into the end all be all of moving a bottle of wine, depending on the channel you're using and to navigate all those, understand all those and be able to predict all those for like a financial model. Ooh. Yeah. And, and so, you know, you, you mentioned a few acronyms that I want the, the listeners to kind of be aware of. DTC stands for direct to consumers, right? So that's you're selling direct to consumers. COGS, cost of goods sold. So for a, maybe kind of give an explanation of some cost of goods sold that you see in the wine industry. So the so the listeners kind of have a better understanding of what cost of goods sold is. So if we took one bottle of wine, did you buy those grapes? If you bought the grapes off the vine, how much did you pay per ton? If you bought them as liquid, did that liquid come inside of a bottle? Are you paying for the glass yourself? Are you paying for the corks? How much do you pay per label that you create? Are you working with a great artist? Are you just slapping something on it? Are you waxing it? Are you putting foil over the cork? How are you marketing it? How are you selling it? What channel is it getting sold in? How much are they taking off top per channel if someone else is helping you sell that bottle of wine? And then we could probably add a few other things to that. But it's kind of like when you see, it's like, take a sneaker on the wall. You see the swoosh, you see the, yeah. the soles, the shoelaces, but before that thing was, it was getting made. How much did the shoelace cost? What's the foam that goes in it? Who's stitching it? Did it come from a different country? What's shipping and what's freight? You know, like there's just a lot of moving. Part. And I mean, to be honest with you, man, I'm, I'm impressed that I can even say this stuff. I've, it's been a learning curve for me. And it's a constant learning curve. I think I've been organically more of a people person, connector, marketer, storyteller, than like a traditional economic businessman. But I think that serves me well because I think I'm smart enough to learn. And I think that if I can do both of those things, then I become dangerous. And that's what I'm trying to do. So I'm learning all the time that I'm not a, I'm not a CFO at all. Um, if I could yeah. put one in my pocket <laughs> and not have to pay them. <laughs> <laughs> Man, me too. Me too. You know, one of the things you mentioned first, you, you mentioned that you started this business during the pandemic, which is difficult enough. And you also mentioned, you know, your background, you kind of feel yourself as a marketer. How did you market this brand during the pandemic? How did you brand it? How did you get the word out? You know, some of those difficulties of getting people to taste it. How did you guys build that during the pandemic? So one nice thing about the pandemic, if you studied the wine industry, is that people weren't leaving their house. So they were finally sending a lot. They were more people were shipping wine to their door. More people were doing happy hours with their friends. More people were drinking in general wine. Oh sales. yeah. I got, I got, I put on a couple LBs. <laughs> yeah. I think a lot of people did. Right. Um, and then I think we had people's attention. I mean, again, Channing Fry is my business partner and Channing Fry launching a wine brand and being an African-American in the wine space. And then also being on the cover of some magazines, doing some social media, doing some podcasts, like, Kevin Love joining us, us being, you know, we're also come from a world where we like to work with content creators and, and wine's always, I think it's always lacked in the storytelling capacity. I think just a, a B-roll of a talking head of some old white guy talking about <laughs> soil that I stand on, like that shit doesn't go that far anymore. As far as I'm so, I think we just had the, I think it's the perfect storm of people, place, timing. Um, and then I think we had the ability to get outside of the normal uh, realms of grabbing people's attention and, like and again that's part of it though like i didn't launch chosen not knowing that channing fry uh has a platform and wants to use it and wants yeah. and loves freaking wine right yeah um kev too who you know and he's busy playing basketball so it's hard for him to be as involved as chan is um i think we're also our team's good at some of that stuff we also have friends that are incredible they get paid a lot of money to create commercials and work this and do that that have kind of given hey i love what you guys are doing how can i help right we know you're bootstrapping it how can, how can we get this thing done? So I think it's just been a, a few key mechanisms that we're maybe a little better at than other people. Not to, that sounds kind of bad, but that's, you know, I think we had the where the vision to create a new fresh brand in the wine space that allowed people to kind of go, Oh, this feels good. This feels like what I want to be paying attention to. When I get on social media, this matches what I buy and do. This is, yo, like, 
chosen family. Like I call my friends, my chosen family. Like, I think we kind of hit a few things that resonated. Um, and then again, we come, I come from the wine space. I know some people that trust us, right? My Chase is an incredible winemaker. We work with other great brands. Like we also collaborate with people. Wine doesn't usually collaborate. We, we work with other, we say, Hey, we're making a wine with our other favorite winery. We're going to put their little label on our label and tell the story about us making wine together. It's like going to your favorite restaurant and cooking your favorite dish with a chef, but showing it right. And then asking them to put yeah. a little more salt in the dish or whatever it may be. Yeah. Like we did that stuff. And I think that's unique for the space that we're in and people paid attention. You know, one of the things you, you said, your, your friends are like your chosen family, right? How important was your network in, in starting this business? How important is networking in general? I mean, it's, it's the most important thing in the world. And I, I think networking is sometimes a cheap word for having great friends and really knowing people. Mm, I think there's a yeah, difference between networking and no, Oh, we're in the same industry. I've met you before to like people whose wives, kids know you, you go on adventures together. You've been through the mud together. You hold each other accountable. And then when it's time to make decisions in business, you do them right. Like, and you can say F you, or why do you think that way? Or, Hey, let me do this because you know, I'm better at it. Like whatever it may be. So, but I mean, I think it's the most important thing. I, I also just don't think it's something, a lot of people will always want that thing. How do I become a good networker? How do I, why do you have such good friends? How do you know this person? And I just don't know that there's a cheap answer to that, right? I just don't know how I got fortunate enough to, I mean, I could paint the road to almost all my relationships. And a lot of them start with my hometown where I was born and raised and still friends with a lot of us. A lot of us went and played college sports. A lot of those guys, their teammates became pro athletes in college. We were partying together, got to know each other, actually know each other. And then yeah. by all means, some got lucky enough to play professionally. Some didn't. While they were doing that, we stayed friends and traveled together, never asked each other for anything. And then you get better at your, and the, the thing people have to understand if they want to work with people that supposedly are famous, have platforms. There's a lot of people that think that that's low hanging fruit, easy to do. And then uh, they'll just do it for you or give you money or do that. It's the exact opposite. And if you're friends with them, don't ever ask to be in business with, the, with them until you are ready to be the best version of yourself. Mm -hmm. I wasn't going to go great, into work great. with, yeah. let alone people of fame, but my friends in general, I'm not going to call myself a CEO, a general manager, launch a brand until I was ready, ready until yeah. I knew I could bring value until I knew that if no one else did the work, I'd be willing to do it. Like you don't, you don't just, these things don't just happen. You got to really be there for it. Right. And let alone if you're going to yeah. use the word entrepreneur or own a business, like no one's going to do it. No one cares what you're, hurdles are no one cares if you didn't sleep last night no one cares if your bills are due no one cares what your insurance is like no one cares you got to do nope. it yeah what what, what motivates, motivates you um it's a great question i mean i, I mean i think you can go the my friends my family i think i truly don't like failing. I like as much as I painted that picture of like, what is failure? I like, if I set my mind to something, I want to be good at it. Um, I like learning. I, I'm very interested in information, meeting incredible people and sharing that journey with other people. So, but I also, I, I think part of the reason I maybe do some of the things I do with the people I do them with is that level of, I don't like letting people down and I like making people, I like empowering people and having incredible opportunities with people and going on a journey with people that I love. So if, if I'm doing that with people in a business setting, that's enough motivation for me for the rest of my life, man. I, I you know, if you're doing, if, if, if I call you my brother, my sister, whatever this, my loved one, and we're in this together, I, I don't know that I'm going to quit very easily. So that's, that's, that kind of keeps me awake that, Hey, this, we got, this isn't just feeding me. This, yeah, is, this yeah. is for a lot of people. In fact, you mentioned something, you know, um, you, you know, things that keep you awake as a business owner, what, what are, what are some things that do keep you awake for the, from a business perspective? Everything. I don't, <laughs> yeah. I, don't I think that's a, I also want, you know, like I want to make building a business, building a successful business as enjoyable as possible for everyone involved. So I think through a lot of like 
how to make this work for everyone and what everyone's true intentions are. And again, I think I'm a point guard. I think I know my people and I think I know where to get them the ball. I think I know what to ask of them. I think I'm a good friend or manager in that capacity. Um, I also think I go above and beyond. So maybe I think too much sometimes, but I think I'm wired that way anyways. Um, thought wise, like I think my brain just is hard to shut off. Right. And we can all find our vices of how we try to help <laughs> yeah, make we all have vices. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I don't, I don't like letting people down. I really yeah. don't like letting people down. I like, yeah, being, this, I like to is- be able to think I go to sleep. And if someone ever, when I die or if someone interviewed someone off the record about me, they say he lives up to his word. I really respect that guy. I love him anyways. He's funny. He's my buddy, whatever. But like when he said he's going to do something, he doesn't. And I think that yeah. a lot of people claim to be that guy or, or that or they try to be these things. They call themselves loyal. They use a lot of key words. And I think that I just want to go to bed at night, comfortable in my own skin, knowing that I've tried to be the person I say out loud I want to be. Or or even more than that, don't talk about it, but do it, right? Like, Yeah. You know, I, I think this entire conversation, you've been, been dropping some phenomenal, phenomenal, um, you know, lessons for the listeners. But what advice would you give some listeners, you know, that are listening? What advice would you give them? Maybe some some things you learned along the way that might be able to help them become a successful business owner someday. Like actually being or not like owning your own business. Yep. Um. Don't rush. I, well, I think there's a core. I mean, I think there's people that can go. So I think some of us are, are can be good employees, but at the end of the day, we go to bed every night struggling with being someone's employee, um, knowing our true value and being willing to put risk our money, time, or energy to prove that we can do it ourselves or write our own checks or control our own destiny. And I think that you got to really own that. I think you... Like I was going to ask you, like when I, I was going to ask you a couple of questions, like what entrepreneurship means to you. And then also what you, what you interview a lot of entrepreneurs, what do you think this common thread is between these people? Right. And I, I would, I would bet that a lot of them are wired a similar way. And a lot of them are willing to take some bet on themselves, have some gumption, have tough skin and want to work for themselves and prove themselves right for great ideas they have. Right. Um, but I don't think it's something to rush into. I think that also, you know, when I, when I was making movies, it's, there's like, go to film school. It's like, no, go make a movie. Uh, read a book about wine. No, go work a harvest. You know, like, I think that there's practical, again, no one cares to shut up and do like, go, go and work a little bit to go break, you know, figure yeah. out what you want to be and who you want to be and where, what you think your skill set is. But then if you can't live at the end of the night with what you think your value is or what you bring to the table, then at some point you need to create an LLC, find a little lawyer find some savings and go try it, like go to work. And then you have to yeah. have the ability to fail and then know that why you failed is because you were learning. And now if, when you do it again, you're going to be that much better at it. And this is a long game. It is not a short game. And all these success stories you read in Forbes of people selling businesses for a lot of money. I would love to know the truth of a lot of those situations and how they launched and who launched them and where the money really came from and what they already yep. knew before they did it. <laughs> um, exactly. But it's not, it's not a, if you get there one day, that's great. But I also think a lot of people, I, like people can ask that of, of you, like, what do you, what's the goal for chosen? And would you sell? And when do you want to sell? And how much do you want to be worth? And like, I don't know the answer to any of those things. And I also know that once you build something that you were like there from day one and helped and put all the things into, I don't know how easy that is to just take from you. And then I also don't know that, anyone would do that much better at it than us unless they just had way more resources and are an expert in it. But chosen family, like our names are on the bottle. This is our, our core, this is us. But so I hope to get there. I hope that there's, you know, some strategic partnerships along the way, but I don't know that I just want to walk away because of a check. I think you got to really buy into what you're doing for a reason. And then I also think there needs to be some positives to it. Like why you do it and who you do it for and how it impacts the economy, the people around you, or an industry in a positive way. I think you got to find some wins outside of just making money. Yeah. You know, you know one of the you're not going to make asked. money. You're not going to make money. All the time. Yeah, totally, I mean, a lot totally. of times you don't make money for a very long time. You got to have money to make money. Certainly. And you know, one of the questions you asked, you know, what, what is an entrepreneur? What do I believe it is an entrepreneur? And, you know, I think for me, it really is just about being innovative, right? If, it doesn't matter if you're working for a corporate setting or if you're working by yourself, being an entrepreneur is really going out there and, and trying to create something new, either a new process or a new procedure or a completely new market, you know, right. And, and 
really looking at that. So, for example, I always use this is, is the uh, Red Hot Cheetos. You know, Red Hot Cheetos was actually invented by a janitor that worked at Frito-Lays that pitched the idea to the CEO. And now he's running the entire service line, you know, so that that individual is an entrepreneur. And, and, and you also ask, you know, he's also a, a visionary. Yeah. He's exactly. And I think there's a lot of people that work in the corporate world that don't think they're entrepreneur. And that's why I really created this podcast is to inform the folks of like, hey, this is the process because you asked, you know, we'd love to hear about some of these four businesses and how they decided to sell. I'm hoping that this provides a little bit of a runway for some of these individuals to learn because America was built on the back of small businesses, right? We're built on the back of entrepreneurs. And so the best way for us to kind of continue to evolve and grow our economy is to support each other. Jeff Bezos has enough money, right? He, he's going to get his ship through whatever port in the Netherlands it's stuck in right now, just fine, right? After a couple billion dollars or whatever. But the really goal is how can we how can we provide some education, but also some encouragement, right? Because I think the biggest part uh, about being an entrepreneur is the risk. What is what is your risk? Are you willing to risk a little bit more? Some people need a bit of a little a landing, a, a runway, so to speak, right, to jump into entrepreneurship. And other people have a higher risk tolerance, and they're really to jump in head first and lose everything and then try it again, right? You know, so it is, uh, I think at the end of the day, it's about doing it, right? Because everybody has an idea right? Everybody has an idea and, and everybody's like 10 years, like I had that idea 10 years ago. Yeah, but you didn't go forward and do it, right? That's the difference between an entrepreneur and somebody who maybe just is a, a, is a thought, a, a thinker versus a visionary, as you mentioned, you know, that's, that's really is putting, putting the work out there and actually kind of rolling up the sleeves and doing it. And even if you fail, right now, I've always said, I never fell a day in my life. I either succeed or I learn because the way I look at it is if I say I fell, then that means I completely stopped. I'm never going to try it again. I'm done, but no, I'm going to try it again and try it again until I succeed. Right. And so eventually, you know, as entrepreneurs and the folks that are listening you're going to have times of, of failure, right? You're, success isn't always going to be there, but use those moments as learning moments and not stick to it and saying, oh my God, I failed. I'm never going to do this again, right? Learn from those moments, continue to grow, leverage. There's other people that have gone through this hardship as well. Misery loves company kind of thing. And so I hope, you know, interviewing these entrepreneurs for the listeners is really impactful because I know it's impactful for me listening to your story and, and seeing how you've evolved and seeing how you created this team. Cause I can certainly see your experience as being a film producer, how, you know, as you mentioned, being the point guard, right? How you've now created this team, right? And the synergy around this team. And it's, it's a really good, strong brand because it was created there in the pandemic, but I'm starting to see it a lot. And I'm like, oh, this is, this is awesome. That's why we reached out. Right. And I was like, let's make this connection and have this conversation. Now, what would you say, like, what would, what advice would you give yourself? You know, looking, looking back at, you know, some of the things you've gone through, is there any advice would you give yourself? Before you, before I answer that, and you might have to re yeah. ask me again. How did you hear about Chosen Family? Where did where was your moment of learning about us? Great, great question. Social media. I actually learned, I think it was. It might have been Instagram. Now I'm I'm also a wine drinker myself, so I I'm, I'm a big wine drinker. So I'm always looking for new wine places anyways. And I was like, Oh, chosen family. Interesting. That's an interesting name for a winery. That's actually what caught me though. The name in general It's like, Oh, that's interesting. And then I kind of saw a couple of photos and I was like, Oh, this is really interesting. Started following you guys on Instagram. And I was like, man, you know, let me just reach out to these folks. We'd love to have a conversation. Cause this is it. Even the, even the photos that you guys post don't seem like the typical winery posts right? It, it, it doesn't seem like that. It seems very inviting and welcoming. And, and it's you guys actually in your work gear, right? In inside of the actual winery, you know, tasting the wines next to the large barrels, wearing your aprons. And so I think that's what kind of drew, drew me to it. Cause it's like, oh, this, this is what the behind the scenes looks like, you know? And so that was kind of cool. Yeah. I think we, we, we have a lot of fun that a lot of people aren't used to seeing in that industry, let alone in, <laughs> with other winemakers. We like me and Channing, you get a seven foot NBA champion in a dark cellar with, <laughs> with a, a winemaker talking about soil science. And we start breaking his balls and having a laugh and telling him it shit's delicious. Stop being so hard on yourself. Like we have, we have some fun in there. Like now, have you ever had what you just said is you got the name of a brand, the pictures of the brand, the authenticity through social media. Have you ever had that experience with another wine brand? I can't. I, I, I've, the only time I will, I'll admit the only time I've actually reached out to other wineries have been the direct to consumer when like I've been on their property, I've tasted their wine. I'm like, Oh, that's really good. But I have never, I will be completely honest or even any drink 
um, product per se, except for maybe Bitter Housewife, which is another former guest of mine who does really good on, on, on advertising. I've never really felt like drawn to their social account the way I was drawn to you guys. It was, it was pretty quickly. I, and I think, um, it, the color you guys is used is kind of like a nice subtle cream or like nice subtle brown background. It's very welcoming. You can kind of feel the organ vibe from it for some reason. And maybe that's just me, but I really do enjoy the, the kind of authenticity behind it because you guys are kind of, you know, in, in your, in your work attire and it's not, it doesn't seem too staged. Maybe it is, right? Right. There are probably certain moments of, of some staging, right? Some lighting that needs to happen. But those photos very they look very art, authentic and or organic, right? And they just kind of done, which is which they is are, really kind of opening. That's cool. That's but that's a I think that's a compliment. And I think if we can do that a few times over in a few different places and yep. people take that. So now the key to that is does that person engage with the brand enough to go, this is cool enough, but I also trust to spend 35 to 50 to a hundred dollars on a bottle of wine or times six or join, join their club and then, you know, learn through them, excuse me, build that trust and fall in love with it enough to become a consumer of it. And I think that's the juxtaposition that we're always living in, especially if me and you can't drink wine together every time. Right. And I think yep. you get in a room with Channing and I and drink our wine and you don't like the, our passion and the wines themselves. And we would never care if you don't buy them, but I hopefully think that that, is a different hallmark of creating consumers. And we haven't really had a lot of that. We're trying, we're going to start doing more of that, but it's been to you hearing you say that is kind of, that means we've been doing our job a little bit. Right. Yeah. And I'll say, I'll be completely transparent. I have not tasted your wine yet, but seeing your guys' uh, social media handles and things, I certainly do have plan to get out there and taste some wine. So hopefully once the weather kind of turns a little bit, it's been raining the last couple of weeks. Uh, but yeah, I certainly am interested in getting out there and visiting your guys' location. Cause I'm, I, well, you know, Chosen is not, a, just just to be transparent. Chosen's an online ecom brand at the moment. We don't have a tasting room or a winery. We make wine at other incredible wineries that we have relationships with. Um, we will have events like tasting events in Portland or at specific locations, and we're going to launch a wine club on Monday. Where if you join the club, you'll get invited to events to come pick up wine and taste all of our wine stuff of that nature. And then we'll hopefully be in certain stores and places as we launch distribution. But we're not an atypical like you can't just come to our tasting room. So. Most people buy our wine through our website and we're going to find other ways to make sure they can get access to our product. But that's that. But if you ever need to go wine tasting out wine country, I'm sure we could. I love it. So tell the folks, tell the folks, uh, the folks at home that are listening a little bit more about that. How can they, how can they get the wine? What's the website? What's the social channels? How can they kind of find you guys? Yeah. Best place to get our wine is our website, which is www.chosenfamilywines.com. Um, if you're in the Portland area, we do have the option for you to buy those wines, then come pick them up at a location and not pay a shipping fee. Um, if you want to ship wine, we'll ship it right to your door shipping fee. If people that don't buy a lot of wine, they get surprised by shipping fees. That's not something we can control. It is what it is. And we appreciate it. We don't recoup any dollars on that. That is the third party of sending something and alcohol. Um, but the more you buy, usually the cheaper it is not to be that person, but it's true. Or if you buy a case or more, which is 12 bottles or more, uh, they waive, we waive our shipping and most, most brands would do that. Um, our social media on Instagram, which is our, probably our hero channel at this stage is cho chosen family wines. Um, follow us on Instagram, go to our website, sign up for our newsletter. That's what we've kind of been a digital brand that way. You can do that through our website. We've been kind of almost like a, a non-traditional wine brand up into the stage with that. Like, it's almost like we do product drops, like a sneaker, like a cool, we don't tell oh, you cool. and then boom, here's a brand nice. new Rosé. Here's a new Pinot. Like, and if you're, if you want like first access, because at first we weren't making a lot of wine. So they'd sell out pretty quick, which is really cool. Yeah. You still have a little bit of that, but we're trying to make more wines. We're trying to have different structures and have the ability for people to get their wine or be a part of our member where we send them wines when we release wines. But um, we're just, you know, I don't like always like the word disrupting, but I think we're just trying to do the wine industry our way. Um, try to make it feel like something we'd want to be a part of, something we'd want to spend our money and time on as a consumer um, and li living and learning and growing as we go. But I think our website and our Instagram would probably, and then signing up for our newsletter is always very uh, helpful. So those three channels should get you anything you want. And then I'm Jacob at chosenfamilywines.com for an email. We have cheers at chosenfamilywines.com as kind of like an, uh, you know, a informational place or ask any questions, but if you need anything, we're, we're all hands on Channing's hand. We're all doing this. We're living. This is small business it. as much as the name's not always small. I guess you could say Channing's seven feet tall and knows a few people, but <laughs> we're, 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 we, we put them to work. We're working. I love it. I love it. So man, 
I, I got, I, I'm, I'm going to go back to that question that I, I might have just uh, jumped over. What advice would you give yourself? Looking back on everything you've gone through, what advice do you have for yourself? Do it. Keep going. Don't stop and believe. Like you just got self belief is a mofo. You know what I mean? And everyone goes yeah. through their way. I don't care how talented you are, cocky you are, arrogant you are, like self belief and comfortability in your own skin, everyone deals with, let alone when you got money on the line and other people's money on the line. Um, but I think you do things that you're passionate about for a real reason, right? And I think uh, if you're going to jump into something and start a business, you got to show up for it, right? Now, I think one of the things we didn't talk about on this and is always tricky for us. A lot of us do this not as our primary job at first, right? It's still, yep. I'm still juggling a Side bunch hustles. of things. Um, so you just got to really don't quit, believe in yourself. And then, you know, I think a lot of people, life's built around, we built a system around money, right? Like I need money to do this. It's the, it's the, it's the golden handcuffs. It's the golden parachute. Yep. It's the, I need to hit this amount to pay for my mortgage, my as an entrepreneur, that's going to be a little tricky sometimes to just live by that. And I think sometimes you're going to get stuck if all you try to do is just be able to pay your bills and make a certain amount of money. Now, if it's about making a lot of money, you are gonna have to take a lot of risk. If it's just about freedom, which I think the most valuable thing in this world is our time, especially as we get older, you can't buy it. You cannot pay yeah. for it. You can't get it back. If you have a family, if you have kids, if you have friends, if you want to travel a little bit, if you want to feel freedom and when you wake up, when you go to bed and when you make your best decisions, the corporate structure wasn't always there for us as entrepreneurs to go like, oh, Jake Gray thinks his best at 2.30 p.m. after he went for a run, worked out, had a great lunch, made 10 phone calls, wrote his emails. Like, I think that I've had to create some of my own infrastructure so that I can succeed at the highest level possible. Um, and I think that that's been freeing a little bit like, but it's hard to do, right? I think, but yeah, man, just got to believe in yourself. Got to, got to, got to believe in yourself. Get out of your own way. I mean, I want to tell myself to not stress as much. I wish I could have slept better a few times, but man, that is what it is. It is what it is. Jake Gray, Chosen Family Wine. What a conversation. Thank you so much for joining us on the show today. I think this is going to be a phenomenal episode. I really enjoyed the conversation. I think you have an amazing brand. I'm excited to try the wine. I'm, I'm certainly going to literally, as soon as we log off, I'm probably going to order myself a couple bottles and then I will definitely sign up for the newsletter. So when that, uh, so when that uh, membership comes out, maybe go ahead and sneak on that membership as well. Cause we have been looking at joining a new winer anyways. Jake, great. Thank you so much, man. I've I, phenomenal conversation for those folks at home. Please join us on Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, and Instagram, and please subscribe to the newsletter on the shades of e.com. And you can also subscribe to the podcast. Thank you. And have a great day. thank you for tuning in to the shades of entrepreneurship. For more information, please follow the shades of e on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, or visit the shades of e.com.